The North American legal cannabis market is expected to reach $32 billion by 2028. Unfortunately, recent cannabis stock market volatility has made it difficult for many investors to find opportunities to participate. Pure Verde Cannabis is in position to become a leader in the pharmaceutical cannabis movement through technology, innovation, and growth. As one of Oklahoma's top private label manufacturers, Pure Verde is seeking investment to help them bring their A-game business model to other states. To learn more about investing in Pure Verde, their 13 brand private label brands, and the advantages of being located in Oklahoma, go to pureverdecannabis.com backslash investors. This is not financial advice. Before making any investment purchases, we strongly recommend that you consult with your own financial investment advisor. If you're like a lot of the cannabis executives that I talk to, then you know the struggle. Finding the right talent in the cannabis industry is not easy. Hiring in the cannabis industry is complicated, and the traditional job boards aren't going to tell you everything you need to know about the candidate. Are they badged? Are they reliable? Do they really know their stuff? That's why leaders at the top cannabis companies turn to Vanks. Vanks provides all the tools you need to make the right cannabis hires from one central intuitive dashboard. So whether you're looking for on-demand temporary employees or seasoned executives, Vanks is your one-stop shop to find qualified, ready-to-go workers that are the right fit for your company. So visit Vanks.com, that's V-A-N-G-S-T.com to learn more about Vanks gigs, vetted, and marketplace products products and find out why they're proud to work in cannabis. Today we're going to take a look at a report from Headset on everything that is Massachusetts. Massachusetts is reaching a billion dollars in cannabis sales this year so far. They're growing larger than Washington where I'm at. It's a highly competitive market. They've got about 420 retail licenses issued so far and some pending. They're also one of the more vertically integrated spots in the entire country making them incredibly uh, competitive. So we're going to take a look at Massachusetts cannabis market, exploring their sales growth, product categories, brand concentrations, demographics, and all of that coming up. It's only entertainment. Welcome back to the Talking Hedge. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your Cannabis Business Podcast. To help me dive into all of that is Jimmy Young. He's the host of the Green Rush Podcast. Every Friday from 4 to 6 Eastern, produced by Pro Cannabis Media, talking about all things cannabis. Jimmy, thanks for being with us on The Talking Hedge. Happy. I love when you connect both coasts with cannabis and bringing us all together. All right. Diving into this first one about the size of the uh, cannabis marketplace in Massachusetts uh, by market size. I mentioned that it's bigger than Washington. Um, what's your take on that, Jimmy? Is that because there's so many universities? There's like five colleges there. How is it that an emerging market is able to beat a market that's been out for 10 years? I think it's baby boomers. I really do. The fastest growing demo in cannabis is the 50 plus demographic. There are people in Massachusetts and New England, once they get here, they love the four seasons. They don't want to leave. So mm -hmm. If anything, what's happening in Massachusetts, there is still a lot of scuttlebutt that they may have overexpanded the grow. And what are they going to do? They need to open up interstate commerce, similarly to how what California did. But you're surrounded in Massachusetts with Vermont just starting their program, Connecticut uh, not even starting, but on the way to Rhode Island went from medical to adult. And Maine is a vibrant market, but there's some quirks in Maine as well. The only one that hasn't a adult use is New Hampshire, and they're still working on that. Uh, so the point I guess I'm trying to make is we're not sure in this market if it has been saturated yet. Mm. That's the biggest gamble because a lot of people think that price is going to go down because there's so much uh, product out there. I would expect the prices to go down just because there's not that shortage um, but all of that, yeah, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Right. Uh, let's look at where, where the sales are going to, um, monthly sales and unit volume, looking all the way back at the beginning of COVID, uh, looks like some of those stores were closed. I think it was the only market actually that was closed, especially during 420 that year. Um, but unlike a lot of other markets, they haven't had some of the declines in recent months. So for example, the sales in July of 2020, uh, was an, a 4% increase while a lot of other states are seeing negative sales. Uh, is there any correlation to being shut down or the way that things have rolled out? Why are sales increasing versus other states that are decreasing? What's your opinion, Jimmy? I actually think that the populace is starting to get more and more curious and it's how pro cannabis media has been built because the more education that is shared with the public, including the 
the clueless pub- public. Believe it or not, there's actually some people out there that have no clue about cannabis. So they're actually interested in it. Um, you know, the older people uh, are, are now, and when I say older people, older than me, and I am a senior citizen today. So, you know, it is, uh, it's a fascinating thing to watch and be part of because I was there uh, in November of 2018, the very first day that adult use opened. Mm. And then I remember the uh, COVID shutdown when the governor decided to allow the medical dispensaries to stay open and the adult use, they had to close for a couple of weeks. Uh, I was not very happy with the governor. Not that I'm ever happy with any politicians, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. All right, let's break this down into uh, product categories and see what's happened at the individual SKU level. Um, be flowers king, right? Flowers king. It is, but what's interesting though is it's at the same level California is, which is a very mature market. So it's already at forty percent. So that's surprising to me. I would expect it to be a lot higher, but it tells me that the people that are consuming know what they're doing. So similar to the U.S. average, um, some subtle differences, like when you look at pre-rolls, that's at 17% and very low concentration, uh, concentrates sales. So high vape pens, high pre-rolls are typically normal. You'll see high vape pens in a conservative area or when people want to take it on the go. But the the dual level tells me that people are taking vape pens to work and pre-rolls to the party. That What's sounds like behavior that I've observed. I'm not going <laughs> to deny that, okay? Um, certainly, look, I think we all know if we're savvy enough to have tried all these different products, the vaping of the cannabis, whether that be vaping flour or vaping concentrates is the most convenient and you don't smell it, okay? It just doesn't smell like it would be a burning joint. Mm-hmm. So there, there is that appeal to the uh, mobility of titration, as they say, uh, to take the medicine, to take and partake in the cannabis experience. It, it's much more mobile not as in your face smell. And that's why it's sustained. However, when you look at the flower versus flower, even new frontier data comes up with the same thing. 49% of regular users of cannabis use flower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think once it gets down to 40, then you start getting, I think at the, at the bottom um, and at a more, more mature market. Um, let's look at some like less sold product categories. Um Massachusetts still has higher than average sales on in capsules and beverages and tinctures. Uh, than now, what the, does that tell? Hey, now, Josh, you're the analyst. What does that tell you about uh, Massachusetts? To your point, there's a lot of baby boomers using pro- products out there. <laughs> and, and educated. They understand. They know how to use this thing called Google. And they are actually educating themselves. When I got my medical card in 2013 in Massachusetts, literally in the first week that I had the opportunity to, it it was um, a lot of things. I walked into the bud tender and the, the, the one place that was near where I lived. And I said, I'm not sure I want to smoke this anymore. What other things do you have? Mm-hmm. And, you know, he gave me edibles and then he gave me a tincture um, I think he gave me a capsule uh, to your point. And yeah, over the last few years, I've tried them all and and I don't like the edible high at all. Mm. It's too much of a body high for me. I use it to to um, distract me from my chronic pain that I have from four surgeries in the last 23 years and the arthritis that is throughout my body. So it, in my own personal experience, which is what I, I'm willing to share this, um, I got misdirected, if you will, because the guy told me, ah, take off a third of this 100 milligram edible chocolate bar. Well, I took it at 10 o'clock at night after uh, probably one and a half martinis and a few hits of a vape plan, probably. And uh, at 4 a.m., I woke up with the whirlies. Okay, (laughs) and and I managed and I by the way, everybody has a great edible story. And when right. So, you know, that David Ortiz. Big Poppy, the Red Sox guy, right? Just got into the Hall of Fame. When he held his press conference announcing that he was in the cannabis space, mm-hmm. he he said, yo, man, you know, one of my, Elena asked him, are you high now? And of course, <laughs> the, the whole room laughed, right? And he laughed 
And he goes, no, no, no. I use it after workouts, you know, it helps me sleep and, you know, regular stuff. Right. And then once in a while, you know, I take edibles. And of course, then I chime in, hey, what's your edible story? Because everybody has one. And he looked at me and he laughed. He goes, you know, man, don't you? You know, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. And yeah, I do know because I've been there. Uh, slow, what? Start low and go slow. That's right. Yeah. All right. Learning the hard way. <laughs> Let's look at the top 10 brands because there's going to be some consolidation in the market, uh, especially with vertical integrated. You can kind of see that already what happened in, in Colorado um, when you have that kind of concentration. So looking at this, the top 10 brands so far this year across several markets, more than two thirds of the sales going to the top 10 brands. Massachusetts has that highest rate of two thirds. So two thirds of all the sales going to the top 10 brands. That's the highest concentration in the entire. Oh, in so the entire you're say, I see what you're saying. So you're saying that people in Massachusetts have high standards for the quality <laughs> or, or they're wowed by celebrity, right? Well, so if, if you go to a store and it's vertically integrated and all they're selling is their own stuff, then people have a limited choice. And so you're stuck with these top 10 brands that are being pushed in the marketplace. So really, Massachusetts seems to have a really competitive marketplace with very limited options is what it's telling me. Well, Rev, my, our, the sponsor of my podcast since the very beginning is Revolutionary Clinics. They've got three medical dispensaries in the greater Boston area, medical only. However, they lead the league, they lead the state in wholesale distribution and sale of their um, their their stuff. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and they grow it and they and that that has been their model. That has been their success story. And I know they're killing it. And they even have their own Rev Brands um, line of products that I'm starting to see in, in dispensaries wherever I go. Yeah. I got one of the big poppy sluggers in my new hometown of Clinton, Massachusetts, the other day. Mm -hmm. So, again, it wasn't a medical one. It was an adult use one. And oh, by the way... <laughs> Are you telling me that there's actually interstate commerce going on in the cannabis industry that, you know, is somehow reflected in some of these top brands? Well, I, I know in New York, they got a lot of Stizzy products out there and it looked like it came from California, but maybe that's a topic for another day. <laughs> well, you know, and you know, Humboldt County provides what, 80% of the legacy market in the United States. I mean, that's a known fact. And Mexico. So, yeah, right. So, but, but uh, right. let's dive into the those house brands though. That some of the more products are popular than other. Like a, if you have a vertical integrated rec shop in Massachusetts, you're going to sell a lot more of your own flour than a competitor. So seven out of ten times that house brand gets bought, and the competitors just sit on the shelf. Versus, for some reason, beverages. Maybe there's not a lot of competition with capsules, beverages, tinctures, topicals, even edibles. Uh, Let's talk about beverages in Massachusetts for a second. Right. It's limited to five milligrams. Oof. Yeah. So that therein lies a big issue. And I have a great quote from a guy who has a um, good feels is his name of his beverage, um, Jason Raposa. And when we interviewed him, he gave me a great soundbite, a little piece of the interview I have since taken because one day I am going to share it with some key medical people. He said he was talking to an oncologist at Dana-Farber, which is one of the most famous cancer treatment centers in the world. And the doctors were pissed with the Massachusetts regulation limiting five milligrams in a beverage, in a THC infused beverage. Now, mm -hmm. that means in order to get 25 grams, you got to drink five of these things. And it just, it, in a lot of ways, it really doesn't make sense, especially if you're looking at it as a medicinal product and you want to use it to combat the effects of chemotherapy. And why are we hurting our cancer patients without giving them more access to more uh, potential in their, in their various uh, beverages? Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Um yeah, they should be also taking more RSO than some sugary products, but there should be more medical products regardless, and there shouldn't be caps. I think that's kind of ridiculous, but... If it's truly a medicine, right? It, yeah. You know, it, people will... Do, look, you may be on the same over-the-counter medication as I am, uh, whether it be Tylenol. Let's talk about Tylenol for a second. 
because I everybody it's 650 milligrams. It's the arthritis strength, eight hours. And I was in my pain clinic the other day. And she goes, well, you use Tylenol. And I said, absolutely. I, I take three. She goes, three. And I said, yeah, three. And she goes, well, and you know, you got to keep an eye on your liver function. And I'm like, I know that I don't take them around the clock. You know, I take them as needed, usually at night to help me sleep. Mm -hmm. So, and again, there's the, there's a, an established product. that has been around acetaminophen has been around for a while. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, there's a lot of knowledge Josh, that still needs to be done. A lot of research that still needs to be done. And, and we can learn so much from that. Be, but we all know that what affects me one way may not affect you the same way. Acetaminophen because, is, is a report just came out that it could cause uh, autism. So you want to check that. A friend of mine, I think, died because he took too many. He took 12 a day. And his body was in a constant state of dis-ease and that disease created an autoimmune disease and he died of multiple sclerosis. So and, and again, we have an again, endocannabinoid system. We don't have an acetaminophen you know, system. Right. But too much of anything yes. is a bad thing. Yeah. yeah. It's learning, learning how to be a responsible user of this product. It's our, it's our mantra in the industry and it continues to be uh, here at, at Pro Cannabis Media too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's, let's look at uh, this final graph uh, that's showing young people like Gen Z millennials are seeing more sales than average, uh, especially with female consumers. Uh, there's a lower average from male consumers compared to the U.S. market. Gen X makes a larger portion of the market in Massachusetts as well. Baby boomers are contributing about the same exact amount to the Massachusetts market than they do in other uh, states, which is around eight and a half percent. Okay. Uh, and I look at that and it doesn't surprise me. Look, one of the biggest issues in sharing knowledge about this plant is the, they, the nobody has access to traditional television or radio, which is still the biggest uh, media out there in, in this space. So by, by, so the only thing that they get to use is other billboards. And if you drive up and down the Massachusetts Turnpike, you're going to see mm. about 50 cannabis billboards. Now, I come from media for 40 years. I've been in it since 1977. And I got to tell you, over that period of time, billboards at one point were really, really used, but it's kind of looked down upon now by marketers because there's no control. There's no collection. There's no engagement other than people, the number of cars driving by seeing that. And how do you regulate the over 21? Hey, if you're under 20, don't look at that billboard. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, it, and I, again, but this is what's going on here. It's four years into it. It, it. November, November, 2018 is when it all started for adult use. And, and by the way, I do not like that word recreational. Mm -hmm. I don't take Robitussin recreationally. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I take yeah. it when I need it. Adult use is, is a better term. I mean, sorry, sorry um, yeah, adult use versus recreational. Right. Term. Right. And 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 our politicians, you know, obviously make that mistake on a regular basis. And again, showing their ignorance and laziness. Learn. My goodness gracious, every day. I get another newsletter about another research study about the use and how people are using this in legal states, illegal states. We all know that the legacy market is still alive and well in, in many states because they can undercut the market price of tested legal weed. Mm -hmm. So there's still plenty of issues out there, aren't there, Josh? There are, and a lot of them are being talked about on Pro Cannabis Media and the Green Rush. Where can they find you at, Jimmy? Hey, really and truly, we're live streaming 24-7 now, seven days a week with different programs. So on Monday, all day long on my website, Pro Cannabis Media, our Roku and Apple channel, PCM TV, is In the Weeds with Jimmy Young. Tuesdays is American Cannabis Report and also some of the other programs that we are involved with. Wednesday is Calling All Growers, the brand new show that we're doing with Liz Grow out of Austin, Texas, which is just going like gangbusters. We're very excited about that. 
Thursday is the news all day. We talk news. Friday is the Green Rush show. That's our business of cannabis. And we're streaming these shows. We call it the daily binge, you know? So you can watch each one of those. And, and my personal favorite, I'll be honest, it's not my own show, by the way. It is, it is the Saturday show with Dave Briggs, who is a former NBC Sports uh, reporter and now works at Yahoo Business in the afternoon as their lead anchor. And he's interviewed... Uh, all some of the biggest names in sports and being a former sportscaster, hearing Paul Pierce talk about his weed use, Gary Payton talk about his weed use, Calvin Johnson, the Megatron and Rob Sims, a teammate of his. The, these guys are all in the business. Mm -hmm. Kyle Turley, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, Darren McCarty. I can keep going. Um, they've had Ricky Williams on and Amani Toomer, the former. I think he's the all time leading receiver for the New York football Giants is Dave's uh, co-host. Now, they've done a series of interviews that are available on demand on our YouTube channel and also all day long on Saturday on our live feed. So by all means, like, share, and subscribe, please. Josh, I know you do. <laughs> I do. I think with that, we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guest, Jimmy Young of uh, Green Rush, Pocanibs Media. Appreciate you being on The Talking Hedge. Happy to be here. All right, I'm Josh Kikid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, y'all. I'm Joe, host of Casually Baked the Podcast. If you're curious to explore the highly responsible side of cannabis, farming, and legalization, I'm here to help lighten the stigma and build your can of confidence. Download episodes now of Casually Baked the Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And journey with me through the evolving cannabis culture and discover how and why people like you are adding cannabis to their wellness toolkit. It's time to get casually baked.